Hello, and welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. I'm the host, Robert Bryce. On this podcast, we talk about energy, power, innovation, and politics. And in this episode, I'm talking with uh, Assemblyman Jim Cooper from Elk Grove, California. And we're going to be talking in specific about uh, issues of politics and energy in California and focusing on uh, a letter that uh, uh, that uh, you, Mr. Assemblyman, uh, pub- or wrote last uh, in August, August 3rd, rather. So um, welcome to the Power Hungry podcast. Thank you for being on. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You bet. So if, uh, if you don't mind, what my, my uh, uh, tradition on this podcast is to have guests introduce themselves. You know, I've, I've heard plenty of windy introductions and people say this about <laughs> other people. And uh, I, pr- I know I'm putting you on the spot here. I didn't give you a warning. But if you don't mind, tell us uh, who you are, please. Jim, uh, imagine you've arrived at a dinner table. You don't know anybody there and you're explaining why, who you are and why you're there. So I'm a Jim, assembly Jim Cooper. I represent uh, South Sacramento, El Grove, Galton, Lodi. I've been in the California State Assembly since 2014. I'm currently the chair of uh, Budget Sub 4. I previously served as the Assistant Majority Leader and Assistant Majority Whip. Uh, prior to coming here, I spent 30 years with the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department and retired as a captain. I was also the first mayor and council member in El Grove for 15 years. So you were a mayor and council member while you were in the sheriff's office? Yes. Uh huh. So tell me about Elk Grove. You don't hear that very often. A founding mayor. I mean, you know, you, we think that cities and towns are all new, but this sounds. This is this is a newly incorporated city. Uh, it sounds like it was weird. Sacramento County had three incorporations within the span of ten years: Elk Grove, Rancho Cordova, and such sites unheard of, and primarily over law enforcement service. They wanted a higher level of service. And so you had a law enforcement background, so you just kind of seemed to fit fit the bill then. Yes, ran as a cop, and uh, I was the number one vote getter out of 26 people. So very fortunate. Well, wow, that's great. And so now you're in the assembly, and and uh, if you don't mind, I, I looked up your the details on uh, you were reelected in 2018 with 68% of the vote to the assembly. Yes. Okay, and then you're District Nine, is that right? Yes. Okay, so it sounds like it's quite a, a diverse district as well. Elk Grove, median household income is over $90,000. That's significantly above the statewide average in California, about 71000 But you also represent Lodi, where median household income is about $54,000. That's significantly below the average for the state. So it's quite a, quite a diverse district you represent. It, it is very diverse. It's, it's urban, it's, it's rural, it's ag. I have a lot of ag in my district, a lot of commodities. Um, Lodi produces 20% of the uh, grapes in California. Napa is only four and Sonoma is four. So during harvest season, there are trucks every day that go from right now, that go from Napa or correction, from Lodi to Napa. So a lot of your Napa wines have Lodi grapes. Huh, got it. Well, so uh, that's great. I, um, so you're part of your district in Sacramento County, part is in San Joaquin County. Correct. Okay, great. So glad we, we got that out of the way. Thank you for introducing yourself, by the way, that uh, was uh, succinct. But uh, so the reason I, I contacted your office was because of this August 3rd letter that you wrote. And yes, um, it, it, you, it, you, you titled it an open letter to environmental organizations regarding environmental racism and lack of diversity. So I want to just read what I thought was one of the more uh, startling things. You, 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 in fact, cite the Sierra Club, the Natural Resources Defense Council. Environment California and the California League of Conservation Voters, and I'm just going to read this, that those groups consistently push, this is your your wording, consistently push legislation that is designed to protect or improve the environment, but frequently, but uh, when implemented, negatively impact disadvantaged communities and low-wage inland households. These organizations, from their leadership to their funders, are nearly all white and attempt to trade on race issues by branding their efforts as environmental justice for which they do not apologize. What, what led you to write this letter when you did? Trust frustration. We're here in California. We pay 55% higher energy costs than the rest of the country, and it's ridiculous. And what's interesting, so half of the assembly, half of the legislature is from L.A. When they're up here in the summertime, and we had 10 days of 100-degree-plus heat, they complain about how hot it is. They don't have that in L.A., and they don't have that in the Bay Area. So our cost, our energy costs are much higher than theirs. And that's, that's the part people don't get day in and day out. And it's also a lot colder up here in the winter. So, um, you know, and you've still got to pay that, plus pay your rent, your mortgage, put food on the table, and put gas in your car. Um, so it's really the haves and have-nots, and they've exacerbated this. 
So, but was there something that, uh, um, to use the, the current line, that, that triggered you on this? Was there some event that made you see, and you did this before the blackouts too, which was interesting in sure. terms of now, you've ha- you made some comments on Twitter, I looked up after the blackouts. What what made you do this in, 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 in on, why publish August 3rd? What was there some event that made you just, you yeah. said you'd had enough? It was before that, Mary Nichols on a weekend, she, she um, retweeted a tweet from someone uh, from the, the PUC talking about that we had used a lot of renewables that weekend and it's like really it wasn't a, it wasn't a hot weekend number one it's a weekend so your load wasn't that big on the grid and they're, they're touting that and um you know during these hot days what's interesting is you know solar is good between 10 and 12 you can't store solar right now so when you come home and it's hot here in the valley in sacramento you flip on that ac and it that didn't take it that into account so here are these enviro types and i believe in climate change but We've got to be smart about things, but they're boasting it. And right now we have, we have uh, a nuclear power plant online, if not two, and we use natural gas. So at the end of the day, um, we can't survive on renewables. You know, wind's great when it's working, and solar is great when the sun's up. When the sun goes down, um, things come on, and it doesn't work. And these folks don't really address that. Well, you also said you, you talk about the, that very thing about the higher electricity and motor fuel prices and said these higher prices, I'm quoting here, impact disadvantaged communities, especially those who live in areas like the Central Valley, Lodi's in the Central Valley, and force them to pay energy costs uh, more uh, to pay for energy costs than than what coastal communities do, and that they hurt the very people the environmental organizations claim to care the most about. You called out Mary Nichols on that very thing on Twitter. Right. And that, that's my whole thing with that. It's insane that we do these policies and people are always talking about, it's all about poor people, clean air. Then, then be smart in your decision-making. And it hasn't been, they haven't been smart in their decision-making and it's really impacted poor people. At the end of the day, you've got to pay your utility bills to keep the lights on and plus do everything else. So to me, no one's ever really addressed that issue. And most of these organizations, they don't care about other stuff. I, I think it's interesting. Uh, we did it, we were doing some research and for the electric vehicles, you use cobalt to power lithium batteries. California has over 700,000 electric vehicles. They want 5 million by 2030. But 70% of that cobalt is mined in the Congo. And they use little kids to mine that. So here you are, your big envirals. You really care about how we're you know, decimating the lives of kids and decimating a country, a continent, to get cobalt for your EV batteries. So it, it just doesn't jibe, and, it, and it, to me, it doesn't sit well. And that's why I want to call these folks out um, to really care about somewhere else and not just their agenda here in California, which has really uh, hurt everybody. It's been elitist. Well, and you mentioned that, and, and, and you specifically say that uh, the Sierra Club, you said, has been complacent in addressing environmental racism because there are promoting policies that benefit coastal Tesla drivers has been more important. So. Uh, do you know uh, you live in or around Elk, Elk Grove? Do are EVs popular in your district? No, we only got about one percent of the money. And what's interesting, there are uh, forty Senate districts. So in one Senate district, in the past ten years, they've gotten twenty nine million in EV re- vehicle, twenty nine million in EV rebates, while six other Senate districts of the same size receive less than one that coastal district. So it's, it's crazy. And most of the EVs are going to the coastal communities down south in the Bay Area. And let's be honest, HOV lanes were high occupancy vehicle lanes made for multiple people. These days with the stickers, people buy the EVs so they can drive in the carpool lane. And if you're poor, you can't drive in the carpool lane because you can't afford an EV because an EV is very expensive and you pay more insurance. So you're allowing folks to drive and commute in those cars. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, if you're broke and you're poor, you're in your gas guzzling car sitting off in lanes two, three, and four. Um, so it just, to me, it, it, it's a, it exacerbates the situation. And it's a matter of fairness. But they keep pushing the EV stuff every year. They, they authorize more stickers uh, for folks to, to drive in those cars. And they're, they're good, but um, it's, it's, it's just a matter of just being fair, being equitable. And it hasn't been for so long. And they're having a tough time getting to that, that mark they want to have in, in 2030. That's why they have all these rebates. That's why we subsidize it. And for so long, there was no cap. I got a cap instituted. I think it's $400,000 right now. But before that, you could be a millionaire, a billionaire, and still get a rebate when you bought an EV. 
then that 400,000, that's on the household income. That's the limit then for collecting the rebate. Correct. Yes. Yes. Okay. So in your, in your letter, you said too, that the, um, that the, the disadvantaged communities that you're speaking up for throughout the state are mostly comprised of black and brown people and that they commute longer distances to work and use more electricity due to hotter climates. So if I can, I'm just going to push back a little bit because I've thought about this a, a fair amount myself, and it, it's not constrained just to California, but is it a race issue or is it a class issue? It's both. It's, it's race and class. A lot of folks down in L.A., um, they can't live in L.A. because it's too expensive. So they live in Riverside County or San Bernardino, and they commute in every day. So th- it, you're right. It is a, cl- a race and class issue. But, but race plays a big part in it, too. Because and if, that's, you, if you look, and at, that's if you look because, at race, go ahead. On, on, the, on the race part, um, a lot of those folks have the lowest incomes, especially, especially in the Valley, in the Central Valley. And it's just, it, it's, it's, it's not, uh, it's unconscionable, unconscionable the things they've done. And so, I mean, you're speaking out as a, as a Democrat in a, in a Democratic assembly in a state that's overwhelmingly Democrat. And right. But I'm going to, I'm going to ask you again, was there some, was there one thing, was there something that, was it Mary Nichols tweet that finally made you say, because she said on, uh, it was after, uh, George Floyd's death, right? Um, she yes. put something on her Twitter account. Was, was that what, what made you, what got you so yes. wrapped up on this? Was that what it really was the final straw or what, I mean, the, well, the thing that really mo- mo- motivated you? Well, I was riled up before that was, that was the <laughs> straw that okay. broke the camel's back. But, but also, like I said, I, I've got a lot of ag in my area, and uh, it's about $3 billion in ag a year. And what's crazy is, for a farmer, you can't use your tractor in California. They can use that same tractor anywhere else in the country, or the world for that matter. And that puts California farmers at a disadvantage. Right now, a lot of strawberries are farmed in Mexico. And they, they still farm here in California, because your costs are much cheaper in Mexico. You don't have the rules or regulations. So we've seen a lot of ag leave. You see a lot of ag come in from South America now, in Asia, a lot of citrus, grapes, and other things. And those rules are very different and much more lax. So while California is responsible for 1% of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the world, we do way more than that. And ultimately, it affects the price we pay for our agricultural products, our fruit and vegetables in the grocery store, uh, more in gas, more in utilities. Um, so you talk about some of these fees that are attached with some of this regulation. It's, uh, it's, it's just, it's, it just doesn't sit well with me. And so I didn't follow you on the tractor. You said that your, your farmers in, in, in Lodi in your district aren't, can't, can't use their, their tractors because of air, is it air quality rules? Because What's it, the reason? Because, yeah, because CARBS deemed it, 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 it may be three or four years old, but it no longer falls into that special category for cap car, for CARB. So it can't be used anywhere in California. So this has been an issue for years with farmers and ag producers, where you can't. That's on use a standard equipment. on a standard diesel diesel tractor can't be used. Yeah, yeah. Wow. They want they want yeah because it, in their in their in their opinion it, it, it pollutes too much. Well, it's polluting everywhere else too. And these these are newer engines that that are much better. So it's just an arbitrary decision. So so I so really if you're if you farm here you you're at a distinct disadvantage. You pay a lot more in fees everything else so it makes it tough and that's what drives our prices up at the uh, grocery store well so let me follow up on mary nichols because i've, I've not met her I, I you know i've written i've read quite a bit about her but she's an extraordinary right. powerful appointed uh, uh uh a policymaker in california she said on right. her on her uh, it was after the and the the la sentinel which is one of the few publications that wrote about your letter she they pointed right. out that uh, that on nichols twitter account uh, she put up a post and then later deleted it, but it was after the death of George Floyd. She said, uh, I can't breathe speaks to police violence, but also applies to the struggle for clean air. Environmental right. racism is just one form of racism. It's all toxic. Government needs to clean it up in word and deed. And then you on Twitter said, how dare you use a dying man's plea for help as a way to discuss your agenda? Have you no shame? And then right. she, she deleted the tweet. So, I, I mean... I don't know. Is that a small victory? I mean, how do you think? How do you view Nichols' power in California, and what is there anything that can be done to restrain it? Because it does seem like she has very wide latitude. Mary Nichols' power is unchecked. Um, they've instituted a lot of rules and regulations that impact Californians, and she's a bureaucrat. She's not elected. 
she's over there making decisions that impact us all. And at the end of the day, we pay more in gas and utilities because of her. And, it, and it's not right. And people should be upset about it. But people don't follow it. And, you know, it's, it's here. People go along to get along. They don't want to speak up. And uh, having spent 30 years as a cop and I had folks that wanted to kill me and uh, put contracts out on me. And um, I'm not scared. I don't, I'm not afraid to speak out. This is not my first job. So. Well, so have the have have any of the environmental groups that you targeted here? I mean, you've really called them out in a way that I don't recall other elected officials, uh, particularly Democrats, uh, th that have been willing to do this. Have they replied at all or made any response to your letter? Sierra Club responded. They were the only ones that res responded, and they talked about it. But otherwise, the rest haven't responded. Because, I mean, to be honest, they, they have no response. And what did the Sierra Club say? They, they admitted that there had been some issues they're trying to do it. But, you know, let's, let's see if we want to work together. I'm going to talk to them next year about, um, let's see about uh, on those, on those uh, EV batteries made from cobalt. Let's make sure that no kids are used, no child labor is used to manufacture them. But let's see what they have to say about that. I'm, I'm curious. You know, they want to talk about that and they want to, they're so clean and green and, you know, and all that. Let, let, let's put their money where their mouth is. Well, it's interesting you talk. That's uh, a good point. You, it's interesting you talk about Tesla. I live in Austin, Texas. The uh, two local, the Travis Travis County and the Dell Valley Independent School District, just gave sixty million dollars in tax rebates to uh, Tesla to build a new. Uh, supposedly, they're going to build a new truck factory here. Well, it's an electric right. electric truck factory uh, with base cost to base price of forty thousand dollars this is not a i mean these this is the bmw of 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 pickup trucks so right i mean what's your what's your take on just this is a little bit of a, a maybe out of left field what's your take on elon musk and tesla do you do you, do you resent his ability to get all these subsidies how do you view him well, well government's doing that i think you know he's, he's a businessman but at the end of the day um government needs to be held accountable and they're offering these um you know, obviously these freeze and these fees and breaks to him. Um, there's a lot. To, there's a lot to talk about that. And you know, it's just I'm not. I'm not one to slam local government because all politics is local. Uh, but you got to look at what, what you're doing. Are you giving away the farm for it? So, so what's your view on the EV subsidies? Then you've you've managed to get a, a cap on the on the income levels of the people that right. get them. But, right. but are they worthwhile? Should they be retained or should they be just discarded altogether? They shouldn't be retained. There's no reason. In so, California, so that's so part get, of rid, get, get rid of all the EV subsidies, and, and but you don't, but you don't have any support for that in the assembly. Correct. And people buy them because they want to buy them, and they want they want to help the climate. That's great. Buy them yourself. Buy them on your own. And the folks that are buying them can't afford to buy them without a subsidy. Let's be honest. You get a, a federal tax break, you get money back from California, and you get a sticker to drive in a carpooling. That's the only reason people do it. The majority right now is for that carpooling sticker. Because traffic is so bad in California. So but on the other hand, so the, on the other EV, hand, the EV is not just about the climate. This is a way to get get through traffic. This is about mobility for wealthy people as opposed to mobility for low and middle income people. Absolutely, one hundred percent. Well, how much is this going to be then tied in? Because I've also been reading about the vehicle miles travel rule, which just came into place this summer, correct? Right. And that yeah. seems even in some ways, I'll use the word pernicious, than the than the than the EV subsidy because it effectively is taxing housing based on the amount of driving that would be done by the people living in those buildings, right? So it's raising correct. the cost. It's it's attaching a it's making a higher price of housing based on a mobility standard. So it's not just a carbon tax. It's actually, or an energy tax, it's actually a mobility tax. Is that, am I reading it right? Correct. So a lot of our gas taxes here in California paid for our roadway maintenance. That has gone down. And with EVs being used now, they aren't paying gas tax. So that, that's an important thing. Just think about it. You fill up, it helps pay for the roadways. The EVs haven't paid anything because they've been subsidized. So how do we change that narrative? How do we fix that? And that's really been the big issue. And it, you can't just keep subsidizing them forever. I mean, we've had 10 years of rebates. And when you look at the rebates, you know, look where it's gone. It's, it's crazy that it's gone to those communities that don't have the air problems. The air is the worst in the Central Valley because the mountains trap it. On the coastal communities, they don't have air problems. But that's where all your EVs are. So they tout it as, hey, cleaner air. Well, it's not helping the Central Valley. It doesn't help my constituents at all. 
so that the air quality that, and that was the part, one of the interesting things about, I mean, Mary Nichols quote talks about that very issue about uh, 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 the applies to the struggle for clean air. You're saying, no, there's no, the, the struggle for clean air in the central Valley is not being addressed. And instead it's yet cleaner air because the ocean blows on the coastal communities, but the ocean air blows onto the ocean community. So you're saying your air quality is not a, the, for your constituents isn't improving at all. Correct. Is that, is that right? Yes. Well, so then what, ha- what, what, um, what's the next step then? What, I mean, eliminate the EV subsidies, you, you that you're clearly in favor of that. What, but what are, if, if I appointed you, if I made you, gave you Mary Nichols job, or if I gave you the job to oversee environmental policy in California, what, what's essential? What are the, what are the first things you do? The first three things you do to try and bring these costs down because California's really facing some serious challenges. We are obviously because of COVID-19 and California is very expensive to live in. If you look at it as a state, um, right now we have a, a, a huge homeless problem. We've thrown a billion dollars out. We're trying to fix that. Our housing problem is we're way behind because of our environmental laws. So there's a lot of things. And CARB's used a lot of money over the years and done a lot of programs. But we don't have any metrics for what they've done. Has it been effective, the things you've done? We've had legislators write letters to CARB asking them for information. You can't get anything out of it. And, and like I said, Mary Nichols, she's not elected. And ultimately, her boss is the governor. She works for the governor. So it's very frustrating on our part that they're implementing these policies and procedures that impact all Californians. And there's really no accountability. And that, that's probably the most troubling. It should trouble everyone. How, how is someone instituting these rules? And at the end of the day, in, in, I guess in layman's term, has the juice been worth a squeeze on all these programs? And I got to tell you, it hasn't. Well, I'm glad to hear you use juice in your metaphor there. I, I have a new film out called Juice is the Juice Worth the Squeeze. I'm, I've heard a lot of aphorisms. I've never heard that one. I like that. Yeah. So do you have much support in the assembly? I mean, for people who I mean, were among your colleagues, did they read your letter? Was there any response among you got some response from Sierra Club? Did, did you get any other positive response from your from your colleagues? From some, yeah, they, they, and they still don't know the issues. I mean, we've got people that come in from a wide variety of backgrounds. They have different issues. So this has been a big deal for me and with my constituents and, and how we change that narrative. And we, and we have to at some point because costs aren't going down. Costs are going up, and people want to see more solar and more wind, and that is not helpful. Like I said, what's crazy is they want to reduce natural gas. We have a lot of natural gas fired plants. So – when it's five o'clock comes here in California and it's hot, you fire up that natural gas plant and those turbines turn, you can have energy on demand right away. That's not happening with solar or wind. You know, 20 years from now or 10 years from now, we may have battery storage. We don't have it right now. And we aren't gonna have it anytime in the next foreseeable future. Reliable battery storage. So they wanna do it with all natural gas, um, pump storage where you, you know, you're pumping water up and then in the, at nighttime when it's when it's uh, cheap rates and then pushing it down the daytime and driving those turbines, that doesn't count as renewable energy. So it's just some of the, some of the policies they do are just insane, and it really benefits uh, that enviro crowd. And they aren't representative of California. Well, so how does that class issue play out? Because this is something that I've looked at both in terms of of, of energy siting. Um, you know, refineries is one part of that too, but particularly on new renewable projects being cited in counties that are low income. Uh, it's true in California. It's true in a lot of other states. But what success is California even having in, in terms of citing new wind, building new transmission lines? Are you hopeful that the state can even come close with renewables when it comes to meeting demand? There's no way we can do enough renewables. They keep putting a lot of money towards renewables. And it, the bang isn't worth a buck. And maybe later on it'll be, but we're not juice, right the now. Juice the juice not isn't there. worth the squeeze. <laughs> <laughs> All these metaphors, yeah. <laughs> but um, and that, yeah, and that's that's just the frustrating part. I mean, like I said, I, I, climate change is real. I believe in it, but we've gone too far in that the decisions they've made have impacted Californians at every level, from your you know your middle class um, to working class families. They don't have the poor families. They can't afford this. Like I said, you got to have your utilities. You got a gas in your car. 
So does the has the blackout changed the tenor of the debate there? I mean, it, I mean, it it's gotten tremendous amount of coverage. I've written about it myself, and it's gotten tremendous coverage across the country. It, but right. it, did it change the the the, the outlook in uh, among your colleagues in the assembly? I mean, how how seriously is was that? Are those blackouts being taken? Very seriously. It's on their it's on their radar now, and they, they don't want to see it again. And it really made folks take a step back. Those three natural glass plants they were going to close. They're not going to close them now. What about this push for all electric in, in California? The, the, the move away from natural gas in buildings, that's been the big push pushed by the Sierra Club. What, what do you think of that? I, I hate it. That's where California wants to, hit, wants to move. Think about it. Most houses were built in California before 1950, 1960. So most houses have gas cooking and gas heating. And then California wants to push a mandate for all new buildings that are built or powered by electricity for your um, heating and cooling, and also for your cooking. Think about right. that. Close, Electricity close, rates. Close, close drying and water heating as yeah, well. Yeah, close right? drying. So, so we have the highest prices in the country for electricity. So just think if you get rid of gas. And in restaurants too, no restaurant cook wants to cook on an electric top. It's all gas top. So, I mean, you think about the impacts. It's just, oh, well, it's got to be green. It's got to be you know, renewable. That doesn't always work. Gas has been effective. and It's, it's, it's clean gas. It's natural gas, and, and even even what's 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 you know most of our gas in California for vehicles comes in via tanker or rail car. So you know what's that what's that what's that carbon footprint of that um, tanker coming from the Middle East all the way to California? They don't, they don't care about that. They don't want any gas coming out of the ground in California. And now you're talking, about, you're talking about oil, crude oil production. Oil now, crude oil. Bring, right, yeah, bring in so oil that's from overseas. Yeah, I got you. Yeah. Just the things they do, and, and what, what what happens to some of those Middle Eastern countries where it's produced at? What, what's their human rights record? You know, you really dig down deep into things. It, it's it's it, it just it, it it makes you shake your head. This has gone on for a long time, and these folks have a lot of influence over here and a lot of power in the legislature. And to me, they have too much power. Well, so describe your politics to me, because, you know, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm just a member of the disgusted party. And, you know, I've interviewed a lot of people in my career. And, and if I, if I would close my eyes, I'd think, well, okay, Jim Cooper sounds kind of like a Republican, right? And I'm, and I'm not, you know, I know that's yeah, a no. bad word. I know that's a bad word in California, but the, but the things that you're talking about are, aren't, to me, don't seem like they're partisan issues. It's not a, it's not really right. a divide. It, it's about, well, who are your constituents and how do you represent them and particular to pr- protect them from regressive taxation, which when I hear you talking, that's what I, that's the message I hear. Am I, am, am I right? Well, I'm, I'm a died in the world Democrat my whole life, hundred percent on social issues, just on some of the issues with, with business and the economy. You know, I, I just have concerns and I, I want to voice those concerns because you hear it from businesses in your district. So I have a lot of ag, a lot of industry, and it's tough. And, and these people employ a lot of, a lot of my uh, voters. And we make it difficult day in and day out on folks who do business, and that has to change. So I, to me, I, I call myself the Common Sense Caucus. The Common Sense you know, Caucus. And, yeah, it's common like common Sense Caucus, yeah. And people just want, people just want to be treated fairly. And, and right now it's not in the... The, uh, the economic divide between the have and have nots has increased dramatically. So let me take a quick break here. All thank you all for listening. I'm going to come back to uh, Assemblyman Jim Cooper. You're listening to the Power Hungry podcast. Uh, if you like this episode um, and you like our discussion with Assemblyman Jim Cooper, check out our other episodes of the podcast uh, on the Power Hungry Podcast. So that's the uh, in media risk. That's the uh, middle message of this. So y- you you talked about the blackouts and things changing. So what? But what's going to be you're, the, you're gonna, the the gas plants are going to continue to stay open, but the push right. to uh, electrify everything to move not just residential consumers, commercial businesses away from natural gas, but the other big push is on to electrify transportation. And right. that if you look at the blackouts now, and I look at it again from a distance, but I'm saying well. They can't manage the load they have now. Where are they going to get that additional hundreds of terawatt hours? I think Southern California Edison estimated 130 terawatt hours. Where will that, how, how can that be accommodated? Is there, has that been discussed? Has that come to the fore at all in the wake of the blackouts? It has not been discussed. They can't produce that amount of electricity. Right now, most of your bus systems, public transportation, run on CNG, clean natural gas. And they want to get rid of that. And like I said, with, with, with the... Um, 
um, blackouts, it's, it's troubling. One of my colleagues one day forgot to plug his uh, EV in in the Bay Area and was late for session because he had to wait the next morning and get it charged. So just think about the blackouts. If, if you're with the fires up here and you have no power for five or 10 days, you know, what do you do? Things don't work. You have to have a reliable backup. And right now we don't have that. And we're not going to have that for some time. And then also the rare mineral, minerals for your uh, batteries, be it EV batteries or even um, cell phone batteries. It is hard to get. You, you mentioned that on, well, it was your, your Twitter post on August 21st. You said everyone was saying we need more battery storage. And, and this was shortly after, I guess, Cal ISO announced that they were going to add more batteries. You said, but I right. have questions. The state energy peak is 50,000 megawatts. So how much lithium would we need to extract to serve that need? How many more black children in the Congo will have to suffer this demand? And then you have hashtag environmental racism, hashtag blood battery, Hashtag exploiting black children at what cost? You call out Mary Nichols. I mean, you're you're on the warpath here, aren't you? I mean, you really you're taking. You're ta- <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel lonely? <laughs> yeah, you're you're on an island sometimes, but but I'm on the I'm on the right side, and they can't answer those questions. They can't tell you where it comes comes from or how effective these programs are. They can't say it. It is kind of pie in the sky. I mean, you know what? We all want clean air, but you know you, you got to do things smart, and then no one ever. It, no one ever really goes back and analyzes what's been done and what the impact's been. And, and we're seeing that right now, some poor decision-making. So I, I brought this up before, but I just want to make sure I understand. So if, 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 if I appointed you in charge of energy policy, as I recall, you said, well, first eliminate the EV subsidies. And then, and then what right. after that? What would you do in addition? I, I would go back and examine every program we've instituted at CARB and, and, and see what, what the outcomes have been, what the effects have been. Um, because we've done so much, but at the end of the day, have they been effective? And, and right now, CARB can't tell you that on a number of their programs. And, and really, really be smart with it. You know, you want to, everyone wants to be green, but what does that mean? What does that mean, be effective? And you got to analyze it. You know, we, we want good, clean programs, but they've got to be right. They've got to be cost effective. And that's really a big issue. Are they cost effective? Sure. Because right now, we're, as consumers, we're paying a lot of money. And, and what are we getting from that? Higher rates, you know, it's, it costs more to build a house because of some of these policies. It costs more to drive your car. So re- really just a, a 360 of examination of, of what they've implemented and what's, what's gone on and, and really best practices. And will there be political support for that, though, in the wake of the blackouts? Or is this, is the, is the <clears throat> excuse me, are the environmental, is the environmental lobby so strong that they can't be overcome? They're, they're very strong. So the, the blackouts obviously helped it. It, it, it lets you see a, uh, a hole in their armor. So, um, you know, we'll see. Someone's got to answer that. And we'll see more blackouts. I think they'll become more prevalent. And do you, well, PG&E has already said they're going to be more blackouts to avoid wildfires this, this fall. So right. they're, they're, and, but you're, you're served primarily by Sacramento Municipal Utility District, right? In your, in your yes. district or are you mostly PG&E? Uh, SMUD. Smud, okay, yeah, but, you, but Smud hasn't had the same kind of blackouts that PG&E has had, has it? Correct. And Correct. why is, been for- is that? Because it's municipally owned. What's the? And they're more accountable. Why? What's the difference? Well, and PG&E's got a, got a bigger territory, so we've been fortunate with our blackouts. But it, it could happen to us, and that that's what really pisses people off when that happens. Let me ask you a, a different question, but it's it's about politics here. So. Has it been good for California to be a one-party state for this long? Has it been beneficial to the state? <laughs> As a Democrat, it's nice, but you know, you, obviously, you want to have you want you want to have robust discussions, and you want to you don't want to make uh, policy decisions in a vacuum, and really do that. And this year with COVID, um, we haven't had a lot of policy discussions, so that doesn't make for that doesn't make for good legislation. You got you got to talk about things and and really examine the whole issue before you make a decision, you want to really make informed decisions. So, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, it's, uh, things happen, but uh, we just need to be, be judicious. So what's, what do you see as the future? You're, you're, Sacramento is your hometown. Yes. So you've seen a lot of change and I'm guessing you're in your mid fifties, maybe something. 56. 56. So has it changed for the better? What, I mean, are you hopeful for California? What, 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 it, look at the future and see what, 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 what does the state look like in five or 10 years? 
yeah, I'm optimistic um, that things will get better and stuff, but people have to speak up and uh, not be afraid. And, and really, you know, that people want to, at the end of the day, you want everybody to have a safe environment and, uh, you know, have, have a nice home and raise kids. People want that slice of the American pie. And right now it's not fair. We've got we to have people that speak up and that aren't afraid to, to uh, rattle the boat. We've got to do that to, to have change. Maybe it's rock the cage and rattle the boat. No, wait a minute. Rock yeah. the boat, cat. <laughs> yeah, rock something. <laughs> We're getting a lot of different metaphors here. So have you heard this? Uh, I meant to ask you this before. This idea about climate redlining. Uh, I've, I've talked with other people in California about this idea about that the climate policy has become such that, in fact, it acts as redlining both in, in, well, in terms of housing. Is that a familiar term to you? No, I, I haven't heard it, but I, it, it makes sense, though, yes because people don't want more houses built and i think it's interesting because they don't want to they want to build up not out and they want to see more multifamily housing and that's great living in the downtown area if you're young or if you're old you know you move on life but as as a as a parent with kids that are growing up you know you want to have your piece of american pie you want to have a, have a house a backyard i mean you don't want to be downtown with you know so it's just i, I do see redlining and that's that's part of the problem we have right now that that impacts our housing so you referred to this before but is is the is the is the american dream your idea about the slice of the american pie is that is that at risk in california then i mean sounds yeah, yeah, it, it even it ask is. the question but it, and is it because it fundamentally because of energy and climate policy or what what's the big danger yes energy and climate absolutely on energy and climate so they, can, they, 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 they want they want they want to restrict it people just don't want they don't want the urban they call it the urban sprawl and um, number one, people wouldn't buy houses if the demand wasn't there. And people want to get out. And you're seeing that now. You're seeing a lot of folks that were living in the Bay Area because the prices are high and it's just a different style of life. They're coming out here to the suburbs. They're driving the housing prices in Sacramento up here, here uh, dramatically because they can telecommute. You can work from home. And people are building out of San Francisco and also because of some failed uh, criminal justice policies. Well, let's talk about that because that's one of the things that's apparently, <laughs> apparently at least is, is a big, well, is a, is a macro trend now about after COVID, the idea that suburbanization is going to increase because people are saying, well, I don't want to be crowded in the city. I don't want to be, you know, riding right. the subway, et cetera. So is, is that, is that pressure you're talking about it right now, seeing home prices in Sacramento area increasing? Is that a trend that you see continuing? I, I do see that. And people are just tired. They just want to get out of the, the, a lot of the cities dirty they got a lot of issues with drug use homelessness and you see it uh, when you walk out your front door and people are tired of, of dealing with that and they, they're looking for a change and i don't blame them and what's the root of that because i you know again i'm, I'm looking at this from a distance but it seems like those the homeless problems in Sa in san francisco and in los angeles are becoming all i mean almost unmanageable and why why has the government let that get to that point what what is the i mean I, I assume it's the initial motivation is out of compassion but it seems like something else has started to or what or what's driving that i guess would be the shortest way to ask the question well a long time ago when, when ronald reagan was the governor of california he closed our mental health our state mental health facilities and that really hurt us tremendously um, because you don't have any state-run facilities and then really the substance abuse issue so um, you can do all you want, but, you know, until you resolve those issues, I don't see things changing. And then also building housing. Well, we haven't built housing like we should have. We've been very slow to build housing. And uh, we, you can't catch up. You can't build your way out of this. And like I said, you've got to deal with the mental health issues and the substance abuse issues. Those, those, are, those are serious issues. Even if you have a job and you have a stable environment at home, if you're on drugs or you're mentally ill, it's tough to, to survive. Well, and what's driving the shortage of housing then? I mean, you've been in the state for your whole life. Why, why can't the right. state build the kind of housing that it needs? You're, I, I, as I, uh, the, my research and looking at different reports, you're at least a million, two million, three million units short. I mean, these are big, big numbers. Right. Well, the, the fees, if the housing is expensive, you buy a new house, you're going to pay about probably $70,000 in fees for water fees, park fees, uh, fire fees, law enforcement fees. Fees has just been tacked on over the years. So they've got to recoup those fees somehow. Local government has to. So they're dealing with a lot of issues. So it's reform at the state and local level. Right, right. And, and really, I mean, 
to me, developers know how to build and how to do that. And government is, is just so intrusive in that and just get out of the way and let them build. So, uh, well, now we've talked about EVs and, and, uh, so what do you drive? You drive, you pick pickup guy. What do you, what, do, what is your, how do you get around? A big ass suburban. <laughs> 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 yep and and you pay how what what did what did gasoline cost you the last time you filled in yeah it's about 77 dollars 77 dollars for one tank full that's about 70, 77 bucks for a tank but so when, what, when what the, was uh, that three or four dollars a gallon then what it's right now it's like two at, at costco it's 260 or 270 a gallon that's about a dollar more than what it is here here in austin that's that's and people don't realize that we pay so much more for gas in the rest of the country. Right. So what's the hardest part of your job? I mean, you've had a bunch of different jobs. I mean, an interesting career in the sheriff's department then as the mayor, and now you're in the assembly. What's what's the hardest part of of, of doing what and, and 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 doing that job in this in the assembly? Just um God, there are so many issues, different issues to wrap, to wrap your arms around, and you know, people sometimes fudge here so you know and, and, and things they say um so it's it, it's it's not always accurate that, that that's probably the most frustrating thing because you in law, coming from law enforcement everything's black and white and here it's not always black and white you get people up getting up in hearings uh witnesses uh, being untruthful making stuff up so that's why that, that's one reason why since i represent a lot of bag I've done about 70 or 80 ag tours because I want to become knowledgeable in ag. So when someone uh, talks about ag and really, you know, stretches the truth, I can, I can rein them in. So what about, we talked about California in the future and, and, and you're hopeful for the state, but what about you individually? I mean, you, it sounds like you're a family man. What, what are you hopeful for? What, what, makes, what gives you hope that makes you think things are going to get better? You got a lot of people who I work with, my colleagues, they all have the best intentions. They want what's best for California and the people of California. And they're really concerned about it. But it, it, one thing, you come here, it's tough here because, like I said, we, we work on so many issues. Just a myriad, obviously. Being a former cop, I love criminal justice. I'm impartial, impartial to that. But, you know, to really wrap your head around some of these things and have the expertise, um, you know, it's, 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 it's tough. And we we vote on probably three thousand bills in a year. Think about that three thousand bills. So uh, you're heavily dependent upon staff. You've got to have good staff. Staff can make you or break you. So there's a lot of moving parts. And you know these folks, they, especially from LA, they fly up here on Monday. They fly home on uh, Thursday. We've got district stuff to do. So it's a lot of juggling. So sure. it's, it's it's a tough job. It's not easy. So I asked. I, 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 what do you want people to do? I, I, I have a copy of your letter and I'm going to, I'm going to post it. It's on your Twitter account. Oh, good. Thank you. What, what do you, Thank what do you want? What do you want people to do? I mean, if uh, that's one of the things I like in this podcast is that idea of the call to action, you know, if you're selling a, you're not right. selling a book, you know, not many people can vote for you that are going to hear this podcast, but what, right. do you, what is your hope for people who are listening to our conversation and that read your letter? What do you want them to do? Just, just, just to not, not be part of the herd. And just and just be a bunch of sheep and, and ramble along and speak up, be heard, and complain about stuff. Um, energy costs are too high in California. And those folks have to do something to, to change it. And the way you change it is to, to make your voice heard and complain to your legislature, a local official. Complain about these things because if enough people complain, um, folks will take action. And so, but but again, and, and to reiterate, your message is that 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 fundamental issue, though, that you keep coming back to, is the availability and and uh, and cost of of energy being the foundational part of that uh, uh, reorganization of thought. Is that or the, uh, re reexamination? Is that a fair assessment? Yes. And why is and that? I, 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 I've been that I've been that way since day one by by doing doing those tours and and trying to make myself knowledgeable. And then just hearing from people, especially now during the uh, pandemic, when folks have been unemployed, just because you're unemployed doesn't mean your bill stop. Sure. So, and that's that's I've, I've heard that from folks over and over again. How do we get some relief? How do we get some help? And sure. this is just bought. This is bought the problem to light. But it's underscored this inequality, this inequity with with regard to 
rebates for electric cars and and cost of energy that 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 covid has made that as has, has forced a, or should force a better reckoning is that a fair way to put it yeah it should and really a reexamination of our policies and our procedures and some of the things we do you got, you got to do it but that's only as good as the knowledge and, and really the in-depth and really to go and do a deep dive on it sure so who are your personal, uh, uh, another question I like to ask, what are, who are your personal heroes? Who do you look up to, uh, either in politics or in, in, in culture or sports? Who do, you, who, do you, who do you dig? Who's your, who's your hero? My mom. She had a hard life growing up, and uh, uh, she, she made it, and uh, her and my father, and uh, they had four kids, and uh, she's my rock. I wouldn't be here without her. What's her name? Helen. And she lived there in Sacramento still? She, yeah, she's still alive. My, my father's passed, JC, and uh, gave me a good, he gave me a good work ethic. Uh-huh. So I've, always, I've worked hard my whole life. And what did you learn? What, what about your mom makes her heroic? Life's not fair. You've got to work hard. No excuses. That's good. So what about this? <laughs> That's really good. Um, so what makes it, what are you reading now? What are, what are you, what are you, what are you reading books? Will you read newspapers? What do you do to, 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 to keep up? I know you got, you talked about the 3000 bills. I mean, it's a, it's a heavy workload you've got in the assembly, but right. what do you, you got novels? You are a nonfiction guy. What do you read? Uh, no books right now. I haven't been, just, it's just been bills for session. And then I read the, uh, Sacramento Bee, the, uh, LA times, wall street journal, and just trying to keep up on issues every day and stay abreast. So your reading is just about making sure you're up to date on, on politics yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and current events. It is, it is work reading. If anything, I, I listen to a lot of music, uh-huh. 70s and 80s. I listen to music from 70s and 80s. Yeah, like who? Uh, everything. I mean, R&B, hip-hop, rock, I just everything. That, gotcha. that, 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 that's the one thing I do. I guess one of my, one of my guilty pleasures is that. Well, I don't know. It's guilty. I don't know. I mean, it's not like <laughs> you're, not like you're sneaking donuts uh, or something. I mean, that's, that's right. pretty, pretty non. That's pretty harmless as far as guilty pleasures go. Well, good. So, um, uh, Assemblyman Jim Cooper, it's been a great uh, conversation. I don't want to keep you all day. We've been on uh, sure. talking almost an hour, but uh, I will uh, uh, again. You know, your point about having people listen, uh, pay attention, get informed on these issues. I will. Uh, I will post your letter and, and, and retweet it on my account because I know you put it on your Twitter account on August 3rd, but it's a, uh, it's a really remarkable letter. And I, I would or, or urge people who are listening to this podcast to read this letter because I, it, uh, it almost singes my fingers reading it because of the, I mean, <laughs> it's, it, it really isn't, uh, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm being a little facetious, but you're clearly very, it, it was, it was motivated by some deep, um, deep sense of injustice. Is that a fair way to, 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 to talk about it? Yeah. It pissed me off. Anger. Anger. It, 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 it pissed me off to no end. It, it's not fair. And you know, it should, things should be equitable when they aren't and someone's got to speak up. Otherwise they keep rolling and rolling and gain momentum. And they become, um, just, uh, overconfident and they're just uh, arrogant. They're arrogant. They, they know what's best for us. And no, you don't know what's best for us. You never walked in my shoes. And you're in California is 40 million citizens. And they're not doing what's best for California. Well, that's a great way to end it. We'll end it right there. Uh, Assemblyman Jim Cooper from Elk Grove, California, uh, District 9. Uh, you can find him on the interweb, on the Google. Uh, he's easy to find. Uh, Assemblyman, many thanks for your time. Uh, uh, thanks to all of you for listening. This has been the Power Hungry Podcast. Uh, tune in for the next episode. Look forward to seeing you right back here uh, next time. Thanks again. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Jim.